Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu in our Think Tech studio, uh, where the drone leads. This episode is really a uh, red letter episode, and I'll tell you the title in a minute. First, let me introduce our excellent guest, Pake Simon. Hi, Ted. Pake from Ma Makaha, yes, Makaha yes. Angels, as a matter of fact. Yes. And you are a expressive content producer. Yes. In the world of uh, video production or um, artistic production in various kinds. Yes. Right. And, uh, We'll tell you, tell about why it's important to have Pocky on here in a minute. We do have uh, Mike McFarland coming in. He's stuck in traffic right now. We expect him here for the second half of our show. We have two 15-minute segments, so we'll be able to get Mike in on the second half. Perfect. Okay. But uh, what's amazing about these two folks, uh, the missing Mike and, of course, Pocky, who's right here, is that in the world of drone-ism, uh, they are users, end-state users of, of the high variety of end-state users. They really see the value and see the, um, the capabilities that are useful to them in their world of expression. And typically on this show we have engineers, we have technicians, we have regulators, we have people who think about how we're going to make this happen. But you guys are thinking about what to do with it once it does get made to be happen. And that is so important because we really need the end state user's needs uh, come forth as strong and as loud as you can make them so that the drone manufacturers can do the job right and so that here in the state of Hawaii with our uh, participation in the Pan-Pacific UAS Test and Research Center, PPUTRC, we can focus on those things that are important to Hawaii. And only you, the end-state users, really get that picture. We, on the production side, don't necessarily get that picture. So, now, I've, one of the rules on the show, okay, and you're a first-timer on the show, is no monologues, okay? okay. I just violated that rule. <laughs> the other rule, just so you know it, if it's a red light, it means it's on and good. Unlike your car, a red light, not good, right? right. In this station, red light, great. Perfect. Okay. Got it. So, we're, we're, that's how we are. Anyway, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about how you got started in, in expressive media in the first place, and then how drones came into that picture for you. Um, ever since I was young, I was always interested in... Uh, photography cameras and uh, I took a couple classes in high school and uh, which know, was on this island yes Nanakuli High School okay. and you know I graduated in 1990 so we really didn't have much like the kids have today where they go to school and they have computers they have cameras so it was like a long journey for me to even get a camera in my hand myself you know because they were really expensive and stuff but then I started working in the Hawaii film and television industry. After graduation? Yeah, after graduation, a couple of years um, after high school doing stunts and stuff from the stunt department. Because I'm, a, I'm from Makaha, I'm a water woman. And so because of that, you know, surfing was like becoming popular again in mainstream. So I was like one of the fortunate. So you actually lived the content as well as developing the content. You yeah. were a content producer for real. I mean, you did the real stunts, you did the real... Uh, graphic work and such, even prior to where you are today with the, the, the producing side of it. Yes, yes. Well, I wasn't really, well, the visuals, yeah. yeah, I was on camera talent. That's how I started in the industry. And then, um, you know, I, I bought my own little camera with the underwater kit as well because I'm a surfer and, you know, all the surfing movies a lot was underwater. So I just bought my own kit and that's kind of how I started doing like small little behind the scene jobs or going out with the stuntmen in the water and filming them doing like hydrofoiling or any stuff like that. So that was how I got my start. And so you have uh, seen a lot of change then as time has gone on because you've seen us moving from the film days to the digital days and now to the UAV domain. Yes. So how did the UAV or the drone aspect come into your field of view? Well, before we get into that, I want to talk about the um, <laughs> you investment. You can have the show, you know, if you <laughs> no, want it. No, no, because <laughs> it, there's a step, right? So the, yeah, okay. I bought this expensive underwater, like full-on capability broadcast quality camera kit. Then the GoPro came along. So then everybody has cameras now, right? And then everybody has you the phone. And just before GoPro showed up, so you spent all your money on a big high-end yes. system and GoPro came in for 300 bucks and yes. undercut everything going on. Yes, yes. But, I mean, for broadcast quality in the beginning, GoPro wasn't there. But I, I just wanted to prove that point that, you know, mm. spending, like, so much money and it's a big investment and then technology is changing. And then now you can get, like, a little GoPro four that has incredible quality and brought maybe a little bit of broadcast quality for b-roll camera as well so and it's like the drones today I, today right they're like really 
affordable compared to how they were before. I have a couple friends who like was started innovating them way in the beginning and spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars learning and crashing and doing all kinds of stuff like that. So you are right in the middle of this technology evolution from uh, expensive high-end systems to systems that are a lot less expensive but can come close to the job that the high-end systems do. And you apparently see that taking place in the drone orientation as that's got you fired up in drones. Yes. So tell us how that actually occurred. What, what, have you got yourself a drone? Have you uh, begun flying it and this sort of thing? What, what? Yeah, I started with the uh, Phantom Vision 2 and that was the one that you did you wasn't fortunate that you could use the phone for the monitor you had to buy a separate monitor and you know and then you also had to build your drone so a little bit like now you just buy it out of the box and it's ready to go but um so i started like that and like that was like maybe a twenty two hundred dollar investment and then i got the phantom three so you've been, pro you, you have this history of buying the expensive stuff first and then getting getting uh, outdated by the inexpensive stuff coming in right after you've purchased. So well, we need to watch yeah. what you buy and just <laughs> wait and then pick up the cheaper version a month later. Well, um, you know, you want to be on the cutting edge yeah. of of technology and so you've got to make the investment. And But, you know, it's that's, that's life in technology, right? It's always changing. There's always a bigger, better television system that's going to come out in six months. But you know, the, that, that really leads to what our, our show is all about, is finding out where those future states are and figuring out how to define what that future is and work with the, again, the manufacturers, the university and the designers to get to that future. So if maybe we don't want to ask this, well, ask this question of you and not expect an answer until the end of the show, then you're obligated to answer it. The question is, uh, what, as you've seen this technology transition take place, what would you want five years from now this whole thing to look like to most make your business successful and make your customers really happy in the world of content, uh, expressive content generation. You can think about that for a minute because, you know, could you even have thought two years ago what you have today? Uh, it would be a tough imagination to have even thought two years ago what you got. You mentioned buying things, having to buy the spe separate monitor, assemble it yourself. Now it comes out of a box and your cell phone is used to the monitor. But okay. what's next? But you can help define that what next step is, and that would be really useful to all of us. And uh, But I want to also introduce, um, or I met you, and Mike, who's not quite here yet, but uh, we met on Sunday at the second day of, a, of the first ever UAS training class held here in Hawaii in preparation for the FAR 107 test, which is coming up. I trust you've signed up for the test now? And I haven't signed up for the test yet. I've been okay. a little bit busy doing my business okay. and flying on the neighbor islands, but I'm definitely going to sign up Great. for that Great, but test. the fact that you were there in this class spending your weekend and spending your money going through all the training to turn you from a, a content generator into an aviator, because now you're going to have to learn all the language of aviation and all the graphs <laughs> and the charts and take care of maintaining all that once you have that first level of qualification. That's an incredible investment of your own intellectual capital and your time and your money. And if you don't pass the test the first time, you get to spend 150 bucks and take it again. Right. So this is, this is a, a, a big step, a big barrier to entry to a lot of folks, but you've taken the initiative to go forward and knock that barrier down. So how did you hear about the class? And, and what's your thoughts on having, coming from the outside of the aviation business, now having that couple of days class? What, what are your thoughts on how this is all going to work? Um, for Don't feel any pressure. Uh, I know. Um, well, I got into the class from Mike at mm -hmm. Drone Services. Who's been on the show many times, by yes, the way. Yes, and he was a great help guiding me, you know, and like... Shout out to Mike Elliott, right? Mike Elliott, okay. mahalo. Um, so he was like, he was just letting me know that we're going to have this, we're going to have that. And then uh, prior to the, the, the new rule change, I already like invested in another class to write my 333 exemption, mm -hmm. which is, or has already been submitted. So I was just waiting. Um, so the rule, the, what really made me passionate uh, to go to the class and like and the rule change is that People in different industries are already approaching me and asking me, like, hey, we want drones, you know, we want, what can you guys, what can you do, and stuff like that. So I was like, I need to strike the hammer while it's hot. So that's why I'm 
pursuing it and also because it's a good example for little girls. This is, uh, you know, the, t the world is changing. Little girls are becoming very technologically oriented. So I also wanted to... I know, heard there's one even running example. for president right now. Right? right? Yeah. How awesome is that? <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> so, and that, that, let's bring up another point here. So, if people want to get a hold of you, I mean, you come to the show here and you do your thing, but you also are doing out, out doing business. So, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, what do they do? They can give me a call at the phone, my phone number, um, or they and there can, it is on the screen, right? Yeah, or they can. Uh, it, okay. Or they can uh, send me an email or go to pakesalmon.com and. That's really easy to remember. Pake dot. Pake dot salmon salmon dot com. No, my that's yours is like has the dot. Mine is pake salmon dot. No dot. Okay. Yeah, no dot. Pake p a k e yeah. and then salmon like the fish yes. s a l m o n dot yes, com. Yes. Really easy, right? That's what okay. I normally say when I introduce okay. myself. I'm the, my name is pake salmon like the fish. So okay, it sticks. Go. Okay, and then your number again is uh, once it was on the screen already, but if people weren't quite ready to write it down, it's 808-258-7253. Yes, give me a and, call. Uh, and you want the hard, challenging jobs that, have, that require a real creative expression orientation. Um, not necessarily. I'm always uh, willing and open to hear what a client has to say, what they have in mind, and then taking the technology, what's going on with different things with the drones, not just cinematography or photography, but you know, uh, the construction, for example. What they, kind of, let's talk about that. What kind of customers have come after you? What kind of jobs do you find yourself doing? Um, well, thus far, the only job that I've really done is uh, is for a nonprofit, Ka'ala Farns out in Waianae. They had a fire and uh, their hale got burned down. And so while there was rebuilding the hale, I would just go there and film fly the drone around the holly as it's being So you had kind of like finished. a progressive record of, of the yes. holly being reconstructed or something like yeah. that? Yeah, and I also, I also have the record of the holly before the fire and then during bur getting burned down by the fire and uh, then stuff like that. Editorially, you know, that's a really interesting and important aspect of uh, and where, where drones can really help a lot and that's in called uh, post-disaster damage assessment. Right. If you had some imagery of the condition prior to some kind of a issue, disaster, or whatever it might be, then you have a much better idea uh, from, a, from a remote uh, sensing perspective of what the nature of the damage is. And is there going to be further collapse of the building? Is there going to be a, is there a problem getting in to get people out? Do we have to shut out? Where, where's the power shut off? All that sort of thing can be done if you had that kind of a record, which you can't get from the satellite, but you can get it from the drone flying in close. Yeah. So something interesting would be for people who want to to have a record made of their house from multiple angles and, and multiple perspectives, uh, probably different times a day to get the sunlight right. So you get a really nice picture of your, your company, your house, whatever it might be, as a reference. So for when there's an er ever some kind of an issue, you know what it used to look like. And what it looks like now will tell you what the nature of the internal damage might be. Right. So, uh, okay. and. Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, again, fascinating because it, it's so important to have you as this in-state user. If you think of the, uh, tell us what the needs are, if you think of the range of customers you might have, what kind of tasks would they throw your way besides the one of the, the farm? What kind of, once you get your license, once you get your, your past the 107 test, uh, what kind of additional work do you think you might see? Archaeologists, archeolo especially on the on the North Shore, right? Yeah, the West yeah. Side, West side archaeologists. Yeah. Um, you know, okay. mapping and uh, okay. sites, cultural sites. Um, of course, search and rescue. You know, out on that side as well. Construction, real estate. Pretty much anything. It's every, yeah, it's, anything that requires any kind of imagery. Yeah. So let's let's pick that up after our first break here. Okay. But that that's that's once again the objective here is to get you on the show and other and fifteen other people like you awesome. who tell that story as robustly as you can. And we'll get that uh, when we get back from our break. All right. Awesome. Okay. How was I? Was it okay? When disaster happens, real-time information and the ability to communicate are critical to helping people in need. Introducing the Phantom Eye. It's an eye in the sky at 65,000 feet, where it's needed, when it's needed, above any place on Earth. Phantom Eye is a hydrogen-powered unmanned air vehicle that really gives us global reach. 
The Phantom Eye is a UAV that is built to gather and transmit information, cruising for days in the stratosphere, far above storms, turbulence, or commercial aircraft. This would be a vehicle you could put up over a disaster area, or if all communications were lost, could basically come in and replace satellite communications. The Phantom Eye offers immense flexibility. It can be used for emergency relief, search and rescue operations, port security, border monitoring, and scientific experiments. On the military side, a lot of the work is geared towards intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance gathering. To create this aircraft, Boeing developed an entirely new wing and propulsion system, both highly efficient. The wing is one of the critical technologies. It's 150 feet long. When it's flying, it actually bows up some because of carrying the weight of the fuselage. But inside the fuselage are the two twin hydrogen fuel tanks. We bring hydrogen into the chamber with oxygen, and uh, the combustion produces uh, water. So it's about as green as it can get when it's flying. The current experimental Phantom Eye can carry a 450-pound payload of cameras and other equipment. The actual production version will have an even bigger wing, 250 feet, and carry a 2,000-pound payload. The demonstrator that we're building, but it'll stay up for four days, eventually we envision the operational vehicle being a 10-day vehicle. Once an unmanned airborne vehicle can stay aloft for 10 days, three or four of the aircraft could provide 24-7 coverage all year long above any point on the globe. There's a whole host of new technologies being demonstrated, and this couldn't be pulled off without a team that's coming forward with the innovation and the solutions to bring this all together. Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Welcome to thinktechhawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. My focus is Asia in Reveal. We talk about interesting subjects in Asia. Be sure to check the thinktech.com website on the next topic. Thank you. Live Friday afternoon, folks. Ted Ralston here, downtown Honolulu Think Tech Studios, uh, with our, our guest. We've actually had our guest compliment increase by 50% uh, right here in this last break. Uh, we have, of course, Pake Samanon, who's been on the first half of the show, and uh -huh. Mike McFarlane is joining us. And Mike, you're a man of many uh, identifications, so uh, <laughs> let's, uh, why don't you identify where you, how you want to be identified on this show? Well, I'm not a secret agent. Let's not a secret agent, even though you've got a black shirt on. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Serial I, I, entrepreneur, okay. I start things. Um, I don't necessarily finish things very well, but um, I'm... That's good. Know, start them up, let someone else buy them, and then get on to something else. Absolutely. Um, I do a lot of things. I own a few businesses that I won't bore you with. Um, I'm president of the Outdoor Circle. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, heard and, about that, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that takes up a lot of my time. Okay. But, um, you know, that's, those are just a few things about me. So actually, both of you are very similar in terms of internal motivation. You're both motivated from some inside machine that's running to go do a lot of different things and push in different directions. And that's what I, w as, as Pake began the show, I was saying that what's incredible about this particular episode of this show we run every week is that this is the first time we've had real end state users on. I mean, people who are not just casual users, but serious users, serious enough to go take the FAA uh, FAR 107 test to get their licenses to run this thing. No renegade operations, no uh, sleight of hand and, and non-transparent, but right out there in front getting a license and getting a certificate and doing it all formally legal and in the front of that pack, I might add, in fact, the very first class that was held here in Hawaii for that thing. So I, my hat's off to you, but also, as a strong bouquet, that uh, the perceptions you guys bring to the table of what's useful and necessary in this drone world is really important for the drone manufacturers to hear. So every opportunity we have, we need to bring those things out and, and let the university know, let the state UAS test site know, and let the manufacturers know. And to that extent, um, uh, Zuri, if you can, after a bit, can you bring up the flyer on the, uh, on the state of Hawaii's aerospace uh, experience week? up in October. There we go. This is, a fly this is going to be really interesting to the two of you. This is a, uh, a DBEDS 
uh, annual um, exposure, expression, if you will, in a creative way of the value of aerospace to the state of Hawaii. Taking place in the Capitol this uh, year, October 2 through 7, and on the, cap on the yard out in front of the Capitol, as well as in the basement, there'll be booths and things. So we really need to get as many UA, uh, unmanned air systems or drone-oriented users like you guys into the picture with booths and tables and, uh, and it gives an opportunity for the lawmakers as they're passing through and going about their daily business to interact with people who are actually using or developing or regulating these systems in order to see the big picture of how they fit in Hawaii. So I just offer that to you yeah. and we'll have to figure out uh, um, who else do that you, that you can bring in and, and make this thing totally full of, right. of that. If, if I had to list the challenges of our in budding, growing, little sprouting industry, it's, it's connection with the lawmakers is, is right up there. There is, uh, you know, we've got a PR problem. I mean, it, we literally have a problem out there where uh, we're being associated with things that huge that kill things that spy mm -hmm. on people and, and that can do all this damage all and, the bad and, stuff the drones do right and, yeah. and and so it's it's really sort of you know i watch industries i watch how they start and and right now what we've got is we've got a situation where um information to the key people is probably the biggest things that we can do as as entrepreneurs and and, and business people and talk show hosts and, <laughs> and all of that so. and that's what you guys are both all about expressive uh, creation of, of uh, expressive material. So there's a great opportunity to use that very skill that you both possess in this October uh, 2 to 7 episode down here at the Capitol. Right. So and if there's any out. lawmakers out there that want to come by and um, possibly thinking about passing a, lo a, a law that, or legislation that involves uh, drones, please come see us first. Uh, we think we can help you put something out there that will make sense for everybody and, and you know, br bridge that gap that, that exists. You know, that's a really good point. And it was on in Texas back in April at a conference that Texas A&M had on the same subject, and there was an advocate for uh, drone operations present, and he was actually uh, in place to help the legislators down there draw uh, bills and such. And they took a negative bill that said, here's the things you can't do. And over a period of maybe 18 months, turned it around and it became a list of what you can do. And it listed like 25 different functions that were identified as being okay for the law enforcement, public safety, and, and environmental folks to do. And every time there's a new case that makes sense, it gets added to the list. So this, I think, is House Bill 912 and, or 812, one of the two in Texas. And it's become a model for a lot of the parts of the country, but that was cool. Went from negative to positive, with just uh, accurate and steady uh, advocacy that it was, was honest and was clear. Right. And that's what you guys are once again uh, expressive content. So, yeah. I, I hope the general public will come out too for this because the general public is the other part of the component that needs the bridge and needs to be. Um, you know, they're the poor homeowner um, that envisions drones flying around them, looking at their house, and things that aren't going to happen, things that can't happen, things that are not even possible. But again, it just takes um, the right information getting to um, the lawmakers and the, and the people that don't want to fly them, but are going to be, their lives are going to be changed by them, whether they like it or not. That's a really interesting concept you bring up. Bring the people who are concerned or maybe negative towards the situation, bring them out, yeah. in invite them, absolutely, yeah. and then give them interaction with people who are designers and such and who would listen to their concerns and find ways to make their concerns go away. Right. That'd be great. So uh, Pake gave us a story of how she began into this, got into this world, uh, which was very interesting. She sort of started from the absolute end state. She was a, a stunt person in, uh, in, in video productions a long time, long time ago. ago. <laughs> and that led to now on the production side and that led to the new technologies and such. Tell us, Mike, about what your path was to get you all the way down to the class last weekend to get your license. Well, um, I, it goes back to what I do for a living. I start businesses and I have very little talent, actually. But one thing that I do I, I, very well is I can sense an opportunity. I can see that there will be a market. And when I saw the, the new technology and what was possible with um, and some of the film and some of the things you're doing, I've seen the, the, um, the um, the, the the potential there is what drew, drew me in. You know, I can see several 
business is waiting to happen in here in Hawaii if things go right. And that is the question right now in the forefront and the, the battle we're fighting is to, to make sure this industry starts out responsibly and, and, and with um, safety in mind and you know, all the things that we all want. And, and we'd like to sort of get out there that that is the intent of, of the FAA and all the people are trying to regulate it and so forth. And I, my hats off to you, as I mentioned to Pake earlier in the first segment, that you guys actually took the effort, took the initiative, and took the, the money and your time out of your life to go to a class last weekend and begin learning this thing from an aviator perspective, which brings you into that language and that understanding, which is essential to the point you made of safety, reliability, and FAA compliance and such. And it is, that is such a, in my mind, a, a high mark in your favor for having done that, as opposed to taking a renegade path, which anybody could do and is part yeah. of the problem. Well, and, and I think it will eventually be part of our message to the, um, to the general public is that if you have a license to fly these things, you're basically a pilot. It, it may, you, don't, you can't jump in a plane and fly it, but w the, the things that they teach in this class is taught at a flight school, and it's done from a very um, uh, aviation-based, um, the FAA did it, so I guess that's, that's, that's a good start, but the, what the people that are concerned about them should know is that if you hold a license and if you're able to get insurance and if you're able to do all the things that you should, um, you're not a danger. In fact, you you are but somebody you, you don't want. We need to write that down and look at the video when this is done. Uh, you just nominated a major expressive creative picture for the uh, the October event down at the state capitol. Yeah. And we don't have much time left. With, this is a very short program now, two 15-minute segments. We're approaching the end. but. I wanted to capture that and hope Jim Crisopoli is watching and we'll go ahead and uh, support that at, the, at, the, at the, the October State event. And let me at this point in time say thank you, Ake, for coming thank on the show. Thank you for having me. Mike, Thanks, Ted. come on again. And the rules are, once you're on the show, you've got to come on again. So we'll <laughs> get you again later. <laughs> and with that, folks, we're signing off for Friday.